All right, well, I'm going to talk about our, uh, our personnel again, kind of like you know, Lucia, just talk about what's going on uh, with people who's working with us. Uh, I'll present the research I've done uh, this year with the extension, and I'll go into greater depth in two of the trials, and again, talk about some preliminary uh, trials that we got coming up for this year. So we, yes, we cannot do our jobs alone. There's just, me and Lucia are the ones who get to talk, who stand up here and talk, but we have a whole support team, again, that's behind, that works with us, stuff, and um, again, I, both Lucia and I, we just can't do our jobs without the leadership and with Jim, Becky, and just what he has been able, the support that he gives us, and I think we just can't appreciate him enough. Um, again, I, I have a new uh, person I've been working with this year, Salvador Zimbrano. I'm on stand-up, so he's back there. So he's greatly helped us uh, with a lot of our projects this year. Um, last, last year was with Irma the bonus and she had a, a baby and so she's kind of took off to, to take care of her new one which is understandable so we so we hired Sal to kind of take her place. Marianne, which you know there she is, can't uh, do our job without her. She's a great help with in all areas of our uh, research and of course Lucia and Britta um, we just thank them for their work, for putting up with us, letting us have a little space to do our work too. Um, and we have one that's our summer intern, Kathleen Milano, who helped with a familiar name maybe to you, some of you, uh, who helped. She came in and helped so collect some of this data too. So I'm just going to run through a list of, of the trials that we did this year. We, yeah, we did, uh, Jim talked about the millipedes. We did. Uh, we did uh, two mitocide trials on Defenbachia. We did uh, another mitocide trial with pylon. Uh, we, there's a beet army worm and dufo that we did. Uh, just basically putting spraying on a different rates of different chemicals, putting the, the larva on there and seeing how long they would last. If uh, at, we sprayed it one one day, and then we we sprayed it once, and like at seven days, we we put them on the larva and see if they died or lived, or and put them on 14 days later and see if they died or lived, and to see how long that chemical on the plant was was effective. Uh, we're doing the the degree day model for the European pepper moth. We did a biotoxicity trial. And we did another trial with uh, on aphids. So that was a list of all the trials that we did. And now I'm going to talk, get in a little more depth on, on two of the trials that I really found most interesting and most fun to talk about. And so I'm going to go into millipedes. And again, like Jim was saying, that yeah, they're not much of a problem on your plants, but you know when you ship them off and and then all of a sudden you got three or four or five or more <laughs> crawling out from under your plants. So they were they were getting to be a problem. So this is just, just you know you just see them crawling around on the in between the on the soil surface or underneath there, and they were just kind of all over. So what was what's going on here? Where where were the, you know when we walked into the situation, we had to figure out well, where are they coming from? Are they were they in the media? Are they were they there? Are they under the bench? Are they being brought in with, from cuttings? We have to f first figure out kind of where are they coming from. You know, what can we, you know, can we use a barrier of some sort? What non-chemical means can we use? Um, was you know, is there anything effective that we can? Can we put water around the the plants or? You know, I'm going to go into a little bit of what we did, and then. What chemicals are they? There wasn't. There's not a whole lot of literature. We did a big literature search on on millipedes and what kills them, what's effective on them, and there was not much out there. So this was kind of all new, all new information. I thought would be good. All right. So the first talking about barriers. One of the ideas that we had was 
uh, using tangle foot and just putting it around the whole base of the, your bench, bench stands on there. And that was, one, is, is it that effective as a barrier? And two, where are they coming from? So we could, the assumption would be that if they were crawling from the ground coming up this bench post, that they would, that they would get caught in this kind of first layer, like, like this guy here. If they were mainly in the pots, but going back down, then they would be caught on this upper layer, like, like this guy here, he's coming, might be coming down. So we, so we slathered this stuff over, you know, like 20 bench, the cinder blocks that they were using for the stands. And I would come back and count, you know, how many were caught in the tangle foot. So, we, so I did that, came back and like a week later. And so the first time I did this, I got equal number of millipedes on the, on the top and the bottoms of there. Great. You know, that wasn't very informative. We don't know where they're coming from. So came back a, a week or so later. Well, now, now things get a little more interesting. You know, you got this base number, but you know, the top, we doubled that. We're, you know, we got 10 more, 28. Well, man, look what happened when the, the bottom. It went up to 75. Came back a few days later. And that number was, went to 51 and to 131 at the bottom. So we found out that these guys are mostly hanging out under the, under the bench, under on the ground, and crawling up to get into the, to the pots on the inside. So that was good to figure out where they're coming from. So the second part was, yeah, what chemicals or what, what can we do to, to help reduce these numbers? And the first bit of sub, uh, first thing that came up was, well, can we use a desiccant or a granule material? So we did a little research and we came up with, with this. You know, we got the bifenthrin granules. Can we mix that in the, in the potting media and reduce our numbers that way? We also found out that boric acid and silicon dioxide or diastomaceous earth was affected. So we came up with these treatments. We just one, did one with the bifenthrin, and then we did two rates of the boric acid and the diatomaceous earth. And this is kind of what, what it looked like. Was we just sprinkled you know, one gram or two grams of the, the products on the surface soil, and as the millipedes are crawling around in there, they, they would come in contact with that and then eventually die and, or, or live or whatever. We just wanted to see what happened. And surprisingly, kind of that, it, it worked pretty, pretty good. Um, so if you want to, if you keep your eye on the two bottom ones, these were both the boric acid treatments. So they knocked down the population, you know, below 40%. Uh, you know, it didn't kill them all, but it did knock them down. And then the bifenthrin granules worked pretty good too. But the diatomaceous earth didn't work at all. So that was pretty interesting. The problem with that, though, was uh, the plants didn't really like boric acid in their <laughs> soil. Um, so, so what we uh, ended up doing then was spreading these products or you know sprinkling this powder underneath the benches and that was a that was, turned out to be a very good control method was just sprinkling that around underneath uh, and controlling the, the millipedes that way so instead of putting them in the plants if we put them on the soil that worked pretty good all right well what other chemicals did we have uh, what other you know were there any you know standard chemicals that we can use with that so a, a trial that we set up was was filling up a 40 gram vial with the potting media with this pin strip, and I drenched these pot little vials with certain rates. I'll get it. I'll show you in a little bit. I'll just explain how they, how I did it, and when it drained overnight, then I take the millipedes and I, we had, we collected a whole bunch of them. We had big ones, little ones, in between ones, and I put different sizes, you know, just to see. 
if it you know just killed the little ones or the big ones or what. So I put a number, no number in these little jars. So, so this was it, you know, fill it with soil, pour the chemicals in there overnight, and then put the millipedes in there, and, and every three or four days, dump all this that out and count the millipedes and see what we got. You know, how many were alive, how many were dead. It's replicated four times. All right, so, so this was the first trial that we did. You know, it's just kind of a, a hodgepodge of, well, what do we think would work and what wouldn't? Um, so if you take a look over on the, you know, we got the, the products and the rates, of course, and see so if you want to come over and take a look at the mortality after eight days. Well, Instar, no, that, that didn't work too much. Scimitar? which is like a, a more of a worm product, yeah, uh, you know, 60%, that's not too bad. Seven, 100%, that's, that's kind of not really a surprise. That's, uh, Tall Star, again, was pretty effective. Duragard, you know, so-so, but when you mix those two products, we got 100%. So that was pretty inter interesting that way. And he was probably in the seven jar and didn't quite make the make the grade, make the process. All right, so we, so we went and expanded this trial a little bit more. So we knew seven was, was good at, you know, the maximum labeled rate, but could we, you know, what was the effect at lower rates? So we, so we went down to 175 and 50, and we threw in some other products, Merit, Ecotech, Hazatin, Contos, Pyganic, Orthane. And again, we get the, or, the seven, even down to 50 ounces, we we're getting 90% control. So that, that was pretty good. We don't have, you know, max 128 where we got 100, but even going down to 50, we got a pretty significant kill. Um, Merit, so so. And, uh, another big surprise was Ecotech, 100% uh, kill on here. I, well, Lucia, she was using it with, uh, with her ligus and got real good results with that. So uh, with millipedes, we got real good control with that too. Huh, Frankie? Here you go. <laughs> uh, Azotin, yeah, that's, that's really, uh, wasn't too effective. It's more of a growth regulator in there. Contos, no, didn't work at all. Paganic, another organic material, didn't have much effect. And orthene again, just kind of like seven, a pretty, pretty strong guy. He was pretty effective. So if you want to rank them, here what what, you know, hundred, uh, you know, I put the most effective down to the, there. That's what I would say. Uh, that was most effective in killing the the millipedes in there. Also, just wanted to throw in that we did try some uh, predatory nematodes in there to see if they had any effect, and and they did not. They you know, we thought they could crawl in between their the armored shell and get inside of there and stuff, but uh, it didn't seem like they could do that in, in real effect. So that was a that was a fun trial. I enjoyed doing some experiments and learning more about those. So okay, the other trial I'm going to get a little more uh, detailed in is, is this degree day model with the pepper moth that we've been been working with now. Oh, probably two, at least two or three years now. So uh, why, why, <laughs> why do you want to do a degree model? Well, it's going to be important because if we can figure out their maximum and minimum temperature that they develop, how long it takes them to develop at those temperatures, well, we can set up models to, to when we can spray that would be most effective or determine the range of them. Um, are they going to be a problem in Northern California where it's cooler? Or are they going to be a problem in, in tropical regions? Thing like that. So we want to use, try and find out, you know, how long it takes them to develop at certain temperatures. So we can develop a, a model that we, you know, it can either predict their flights or when they hatch or whatever so that uh, chemicals can be, can be applied in a timely fashion. So the way we're doing this is we have a colony, 
and the adults will lay eggs in a little jar and about a week or so they hatch and just little guys that we can see in there we collect them and we put one larva in a sealed container and we label that label this container so each larva has its own container num one one guy in there and we put them in an environmental chamber I'll show you the picture of those where we can vary the temp we can vary temperature humidity and the light so the, the temperature is variable the humidity we keep constant at 50 percent and light it's on 10 hours a day it's light inside and 14 hours a day it's dark inside and we're also measuring their head capsule again just a, as a measure of, of how many instars or how many um, times they mold through their cycle. So, I, here's a picture of, of, like I said, each each container has. We put a piece of tape and number each one. Uh, this is a diet. We have a um, uh, it's a bead army worm uh, um, diet that we buy and make up, and they seem to do just fine on that. And here's our environmental chambers. So they're kind of like ovens and little refrigerators and stuff. And you stick them in there and take them out each day and see what see what's going on. So measuring our, the, I also mentioned about head, measuring the head capsule. We have a, a slide that we can put underneath uh, the the larva, which are, are metered out each. This is a millimeter right here, so it's divided into tenth millimeters and each time that they molt, for example, uh, when they're when they first come out of the egg they're they're point two uh, millimeters. It's about they about double every time that they they move to an in star. Uh, so this guy he's a pretty old guy, uh, probably a fourth or fifth in star. It was just hard to it's hard to focus the numbers and the worm at the same time. It's there, so so where are we at with this? We so we we we're actually winding down. We're at kind of on our final few temperatures that we got left, and we started at a, a 50 degrees, and at 50 degrees uh, Fahrenheit, this is Celsius and Fahrenheit. We got uh, they did not develop. They just stayed at first or first in star, and and they, although they lived four months off. They, they just never molt, were able to, to progress into instar and they eventually all died. 100, at 100 degrees Fahrenheit, they just cooked. You, you know, I put them in there one day and the next day they were all, they were all shriveled up and died. And so now we got, we're trusting kind of everything in between and we want to find out where, where we got going. Um, 60 is in progress right now. It looks and we've had two uh, that hatched, or that have gone through the full cycle, and it's taken about 90 days to do that. So now, uh, that w when we saw that that happened, we started one at 55, and we're, we're going to see if we get, you know, here and they, here they didn't progress at all, and and this, and actually at 55 um, they did. They have gone to second end star now, so it looks uh, promising. Now on the other end, at the hot end, uh, we did get very few at 90 degrees Fahrenheit, just two or three of the 30 uh, hatched or went through the whole process. So our next step will be uh, 95 and to see if that, uh, if we can get any to go through the full cycle that way. And we can put all this data in and, and kind of come up with uh, a model of how, how long it takes at certain temperatures for them to develop. So again, this is new. Nobody's ever done this. this um, we're looking forward to once we've completed all this to, to publish this, get this out there, so maybe other researchers can use this information uh, in their region. Uh, they have problems in Europe with them in their greenhouses and out outdoors, and so we're, we're really excited about. You know, doing something new and something exciting. So this is just some conclusions that we have uh, about the development of them. You know, right now it's looking like between 60 and 90 degrees Fahrenheit. 
Um, we have already in, in San Marcos, uh, we've had a grower, you know, if they're not caught early, they can become a serious uh, pest in there. So, and again, it's, it doesn't seem to be, uh, they're going to be much of a problem in a very hot or cool environment. And since they are kind of small larvae, their, their head capsules are changing. Uh, is dramatic. There are not dramatic things, but you can tell uh, when they do. It's 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 very distinct when they when they go into different uh, stages when they move into different instars. So, well, what do we got lined up for 2013? Um, we're going to be getting some more miticide products, those, some of those beginning one, the ones that we talked about there, uh, BASF has d uh, developed a new ride side that we're uh, testing, testing for them and it looks like they're, we're going to continue to do some more work with that. We want to do a, a derench trial for the TIPU uh, psyllid, uh, apply some and, and trunk applications. And so we've got some uh, TIPU trees out in the green and uh, on the Quonset and we're going to Hopefully this summer we're going to try and build a population on there and do these private uh, different rates on there. A new one that we just picked up, um, again I'm really excited about is, is four flies and, and a green mold with mushrooms. Uh, growers having a real problem, uh, mainly with green mold, and his, that's really knocking down his, his production and with his mushrooms. and. The, the flies are effect, uh, transfer this mold to different houses in his production. And so we want to try and find some ways to reduce the, the fly population or, you know, help with the, with this mold, with the, see if there's anything else we can do with the mold, change anything that he's doing, you know, is it being brought in outside, from outside and coming in, or where are the fly is picking this up from? Uh, just a lot of questions there that we're, we're very excited and interested, interested to learn. And again, we're going to kind of work with Lucia and with the Ligus. Uh, and our, we have one specific project where we want to try and uh, try Botanigard on strawberries, on plant strawberries and, and by drench and see if that's absorbed by the plant. Uh, I guess there's some research that indicates that it can be effective way of controlling the ligus, so we want to drench the botanigard in and, and putting the ligus on the strawberries and see if what the mortality is. Again, we, tr we kind of get tried this again last year, and like Lucia said, the ligus that we have just like Gerbera. So every time we put them on the strawberries, they, you know, it didn't matter if they were treated or untreated, they all, they all died. So we're going to try and repeat that this year, see if we can get that to work. So with that, again, a very busy year, and just want to thank you again for uh, your support, and appreciate uh, you guys coming out and taking a look and spend time here at the centers. Thank you guys.